A spiritual and national icon is emerging from what was once a featureless desert. An immense project involving thousands of workers toiling in searing temperatures for more than 12 years. This was the grand vision that's becoming a reality. Abu Dhabi Sheikh Zayed Al Nayan Grand Mosque. Building the biggest mosque in the region required an enormous multinational undertaking. The final result is intended to be spectacular, not only in sheer size, but also in its elegant beauty, because this megastructure is an artistic statement on a massive scale. The world's largest chandelier will be the crowning glory of the main prayer hall, while the world's largest carpet is being assembled from Iran. This will be one of the largest projects of its kind anywhere in the world, covered from end to end in the purest white marble. The biggest mosque dome in the world is the project centerpiece. A global quest to find the purest white marble and the very best marble craftsmen in the world extends to Italy, Macedonia and even China. Hundreds of artisans cutting and shaping tens of thousands of intricate pieces to assemble a gigantic jigsaw puzzle of monumental marble. It's a massive and complex international effort. Even British, Belgium, Indians, Bangladesh, Turkish, Filipinos, Arabs. 220,000 cubic meters of concrete, 30,000 tons of reinforcement. The best softwares and the best equipment and machinery. The classical and the modern. Although there's a schedule to be met, the Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque project is not so much a race against time, but an attempt to make time stand still. This megastructure that must survive for centuries, it's got to be built to last. Abu Dhabi is on the coast of the Arabian Peninsula and borders Saudi Arabia. It's the largest of the seven emirates that comprise the United Arab Emirates and the most profitable. Abu Dhabi city is on an island and its downtown area was already fully occupied with skyscrapers and new construction. Short of demolishing an entire city block, no space existed for the mosque site. The opposite end of the island, however, was far less developed and offered the space needed for a project of this magnitude. In preparation, a nine and a half meter high hill is built up to elevate the mosque, to physically and visually dominate its environment. Construction begins in the late 1990s, in the center of an area that covers over 22,000 square meters. Poor communication between the Abu Dhabi construction company and its European contractor caused the project to stagnate after initial work. The original company was replaced. British construction group Haltro International comes on board in 2002 as structural supervisor for phase one of the project, the reinforced concrete shell of the mosque. Phase two will involve the final exterior and interior design. Sami Alcazar's heads up the Halcro team, initially responsible for the completion of phase one. Great consideration was given to the durability, and this is the reason for this is the, the aggressive environment in which this building is being built. Aggressive environment doesn't just refer to the temperature, it's the air salinity that's the real danger. The problem with salt in the air is that it, it's combines with the moisture in the air and chlorides are produced and chlorides attack the reinforcement within the concrete. So we try and achieve a concrete with a, as low a permeability and porosity as possible. 
This is the steel that's meant to last for centuries. The reinforcement that provides the strength at the core of the foundation piles. Test bores went down first through sand, then mud, then gypsum, until at a depth of 27 metres, solid mudstone was found to support the piles meant to carry the enormous weight of the mosque. It's sedimentary rock, comprised primarily of clay. The location of a solid foundation solved one problem, but at this depth, a second challenge presented itself. All the piles are effectively sitting in the groundwater, and the groundwater is very highly saline for, because it's so close to the sea. This salt water might eventually seep into the concrete, attack and corrode the steel reinforcement, and critically weaken the entire underpinning of the structure. After intensive testing, a corrosion inhibitor is included in the concrete design to protect the steel. In those piles, we've introduced polypropylene fibers, and this, with the increase in cover to protect the reinforcement, will reduce the amount of surface cracking in the pile. And there are more than 6,000 of these piles holding up the structure, protected and strengthened by tiny plastic fibers to extend their lifetime. It's the air and ground salinity that will dictate the length of the mosque's life. And as steel reinforced concrete structures are relatively new, the future is unknown territory. Only time will tell if the engineers have got it right. The phase one construction period takes seven years, concluding with the assembly of the biggest dome of any mosque in the world, nearly 70 meters tall. A massive ring beam of steel reinforced concrete, more than 35 meters in diameter, supports the dome, which is comprised of 72 precast concrete segments. As each level is lifted and positioned, the recesses between the segments are filled with concrete to stitch them together, and the dome is entirely self-supporting. Once all three levels are in place, the dome is capped with a final pour of concrete, strongly steel reinforced, because this is the point from which the mosque's central chandelier will hang, all 12 tons of it. The main dome and the two secondary domes are constructed to be freestanding and separate from the main prayer hall below because earthquake engineering has been incorporated into their design. A three to 10 centimeter gap separates the domes from the main prayer hall to allow the domes on their huge supporting columns to move independently, avoiding stress points that could weaken the structure in a quake. The Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque is as near as possible to being earthquake proof. With phase one completed, the concrete shell of the Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque sits silent and empty, awaiting the exterior and interior decoration that will imbue the mega mosque with a unique identity. Phase two of the Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque project will involve it being clad inside and out with white marble and the installation of the largest chandelier and carpet in the world. The column, the arch and the dome have been described as the trinity of Islamic architecture and although the mosque remains faithful to predominantly Moroccan-based traditional and geometric design, its contours are more free-flowing and reflect a broader fusion of influences. The design includes 407 meter tall minarets, 82 domes of seven different sizes, 96 columns inside the main prayer hall, and 1,096 columns supporting the arcades. Two rooms joining the prayer hall are for the women, 
with a capacity for 1,500 worshippers each. Kaula Al Sulaimani is an engineering graduate from the UAE's Al Ain University, first joining the project as an engineer, becoming deputy project director, then moving up to the top job of project director. As a woman, working in construction fields it is not easy. Everybody putting his eyes on this project as government, as people, as foreigner. Why they change? Who allowed to change She meets with her key associates to discuss keeping the project on schedule. The late 2007 deadline for the completion of the mosque structure must be met without cutting corners or compromising the project's integrity. The objective is to give Abu Dhabi a national icon that will last for centuries. So a quick fix to meet the deadline is out of the question. Although speed's a necessity, completion can't be achieved at the expense of quality. And that won't be easy. Hill International's Samir Ohamoud is now under pressure and consults with his engineers about how to achieve the 2007 deadline. Trenches need to be dug and cables laid to fully access the power supply beneath the mosque. Long underground tunnels await electric cables. Much still needs to be done and time is not on the engineer's side. Building a monument in marble doesn't come cheaply. The Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque has an estimated budget of two and a half billion dirham, around 700 million US dollars. Just 50 years ago, Abu Dhabi could not have afforded such extravagance. At that time, Abu Dhabi had a population of 46,000 people, had no infrastructure and apparently no future. A collection of tents, huts and crude buildings, it appeared destined to remain an impoverished desert community on the coast of the Persian Gulf. Neither self-sufficient nor profitably productive, it had relied primarily upon its pearl and fishing industries for its livelihood, but all this was soon to change, when it became the financial linchpin of the United Arab Emirates. Massive oil deposits eventually made the Emirate of Abu Dhabi the key component of one of the richest nations on earth, the United Arab Emirates. Although the Emirate of Abu Dhabi is only slightly smaller than Scotland, and mostly arid and inhospitable desert, the source of its wealth lays elsewhere, off its coastline, just over the horizon in the Persian Gulf. It pumps 89% of all the United Arab Emirates oil and generates an annual income of 187 billion US dollars. Abu Dhabi city grew rapidly to become a high-rise modern metropolis and the population of the Emirates swelled to over two million, not due to a prodigious birth rate, but an influx of foreign workers. More than 60% of the population are expatriates from all around the world. Its success story is largely due to one man. President of the United Arab Emirates for 33 years, Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan Al Nayan was a visionary leader who plotted his nation's path towards prosperity and growth. The UAE now boasts the largest number of construction tower cranes in the world. The Emirate of Abu Dhabi has more than 2,200 mosques, but Sheikh Zayed had wished for one more a masterpiece that would become the jewel in the crown of Abu Dhabi. He had a vision for creating a mosque with various architectural detail from all over the Arab world, 
and his vision was to create a mosque for all Muslims from whatever country is within the Islamic world. Sheikh Zayed passed away in November 2004. His son, Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed Al Nayan, was elected president of the United Arab Emirates. The Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque is being constructed under extremely inhospitable conditions because whereas Abu Dhabi has oil in abundance, it has very little fresh water and relies upon desalinating seawater. Although oil is the Desert Emirates' lifeblood, water is also vital for its survival. On the construction site, practically all workers carry water bottles to counter the ever-present danger of dehydration. In soaring midsummer temperatures, the danger to workers is of losing water faster than it's being replaced. In this region, heat is one of the main problems that we have. Terrible hot, yes, extremely hot. And really, you can fry eggs on site, sweating all time. You want to take out clothes really from your, from your body, you know? Dehydration is the major problem. There are many, many laborers who suffer dehydration problems. The human body can go into severe shock when it lacks water, and unless quick action is taken, the consequences can be fatal. Midsummer temperatures can go up to around 48 degrees centigrade, but with the humidity at sometimes 100 or 100 plus percent, um, the, the conditions are very difficult to work in. Over the last two years, the government have imposed a restriction of working during the hottest times of the day, between 12 and 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Normally, we don't cast concrete in the ambient temperature above 38 degrees centigrade. So in the hottest months of the summer, we can only cast at night, where the temperatures are below that. This has an effect on the curing, the hydration of the concrete during the curing period. Just how critical is this concrete pouring temperature? And does it mean that if it's incorrect, the structure will eventually fail? I would never say the concrete would fail. You may not achieve the strengths that you want. Under the most extreme conditions, this is what might happen if sufficient strength is not achieved. Rigorous pressure tests are undertaken to ensure that the concrete design mix can stand the strain. Groundwater salinity and soaring summer temperatures could be expected. However, a desert downpour comes as a complete surprise and brings all work to a standstill. The roads surrounding the site become quagmires. All the vehicles stuck and all the equipment stopped and even work will stop as well if it was really heavy rain. We cannot expect rain. Although sandstorms are only occasional, strong wind conditions are frequent, slowing down work but never quite stopping it. But high winds present another more serious problem, that of eroding or blowing away the nine and a half meter high embankment the mosque stands on. To stop this happening, the entire hill surrounding the mosque is swathed in heavy green plastic sheeting, firmly tethered down to keep the hill intact. When the completed landscaping is finally in place, sand erosion will cease to be a problem. Early in 2007, all work was stopped and the workers were sent home. Not because of rain or construction problems, but because of visitors. Royal visitors. Prince Charles and the Duchess of Cornwall toured the site. For security reasons, the workers were absent, but the press were not. At 
at the project's peak, 2,500 workers labor on site. A great many of them are Muslims, with the obligation to pray five times a day. This has been factored into the construction schedule, with on-site mosques for religious devotions. Safety officer Humadan Saleh tours the vast site every workday. With so many workers on site, prevention of industrial accidents has high priority. He's in the world's biggest mosque dome, and decorative panelling has already been installed around its inner parameter. Shortly, the top of the huge dome itself will receive similar treatment. Sufyan S. Saleh is the subcontractor responsible for providing the internal ceiling and dome panelling. Even though we use high technology, even though we use the IT, the, the best softwares and the best equipment and machinery, we had to go back to the basics, to the human artistic side. Uh, the artists were the Moroccans. They're the ones who created the, the gypsum designs and, and the, the positives from which the glass reinforced gypsum was produced. So the designs and concept and the decoration was all a creation of Moroccan artisans. Uh, it's a generation uh, business and they do it by hand, they can carve it, they give it all the life uh, that you need to show in this type of carving. So we had to use these people to create the basic carvings which were transferred into electronic information with the IT technology, with the CAD CAM carving machines and uh, to end up with big production of these highly artistic carved items, yet retaining the basic hand artistic part. On the factory floor, a high strength gypsum and mineral mix is combined with tiny slithers of fiberglass and sprayed on one of the thousands of molds. When set, it is both strong and relatively lightweight. We had to do uh, a 3D simulation to finalize all the geometry because these units cannot be adjusted. They are not aimed to be adjusted on site. They have to fit accurately. And they do not only fit in terms of geometry. So if you have two pieces that you like them to fit, you have to ensure that their sides fit side to side, left, right, up, down, bottom. And not only that, you have all the carvings that have different depths and those carvings should match the carving of the adjacent panels. So you, you don't have the luxury to, to adjust anything on site. Once there, they have to be correct. It's over 12,100 panels. Dominating the factory floor is a vast curved wooden cradle in which pre-assembly of dozens of panels is taking place. Scores of these heavy pre-assembled sections are required and they'll be secured overhead in the main prayer hall. I would say that the heaviest ones were in the range of 700 to 800 uh, kilograms. They are quite heavy as a decorative unit. Maybe the weight of your car, but uh, <laughs> that you are hanging onto a dome or on the ceiling. In phase two, the gray austere concrete vanishes to be sheathed in dazzling and decorative white. Few projects have used as much marble as the Sheikh Zayed Mosque, which was conceived to have the whitest marble ever found, like another wonder of the world, the Taj Mahal. Marble has been a key feature of Islamic structures, valued for its beauty, strength and resistance to fire and erosion. Phase two of construction involves the local company Sixco, coordinating and supervising the work of 38 international contractors. You are speaking about 120,000 square meter of marble outside all around, which is nearly mountains of marble which had to be uh, open and treated to get the extra white marble we are having here. In total, both outside and inside, nearly 120,000 square meters of marble is required, including a considerable amount of decorative and carved works. 
But where to find the world's whitest marble? The search would take them around the world. Building the Sheikh Zayed Mosque requires a search for the purest white marble in the world, particularly for the prayer hall interior. This is where Italy now contributes its expertise. Milan in northern Italy is a city long renowned for being on the cutting edge of innovative design. It's the home of Fantini Mossiarchi, a long-established expert in the business of manipulating marble. When approached to tackle the task of providing and crafting pure white marble on the mammoth scale that the project required, the company contacted Lorenzo Carmelini and an interior design firm, a company with a close association with Gianni Versace, on hotel and boutique projects. Although a schedule had to be met, to create a timeless masterpiece in marble would obviously require time. Spatium were one of the only architects who could transfer Sheikh Sultan's ideas and, and visions into reality. Sheikh Sultan was very uh, interested in the floral concept of the mosque. But, uh, the image that the client that Sheikh Sultan had in mind, it was the mosque of the flowers. And Spatium were very good at transposing that idea into samples, drawings and designs. The material we suggested for the realization of uh, physical realization of the wall was the marble. He wanted something very, very uh, white, very important, and we had to find a very rare kind of white marble, and it has been uh, taken from an Italian uh, quarry, which is producing uh, maybe the most beautiful and pure white from all over the world. Marble that's white and crystalline as the snow found in the Val Venosta Alps in northern Italy at the Aqua Bianca quarry. This cold white marble was exactly what Lorenzo wanted. Lassa marble. It's found high among the snow-capped mountain peaks and comes from inside a deep gallery quarry in near zero temperatures and often loosened with explosive charges, the marble is cut into huge slabs on the spot. It originates from limestone. Under intense heat and pressure, it underwent a process of recrystallization. After being quarried and cut, it's taken down to the town of Lhasa in the valley below to await shipment to Abu Dhabi. Not only massive marble, but micro-marble is an integral part of Abu Dhabi's Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque. Hundreds of thousands of marble chips comprise the flower patterns on the main prayer hall walls, all hand-cut in Italy. A second team of Italian artisans assemble the pieces, guided by paper patterns to precisely match the floral features envisioned by the designers. The mosaics are handcrafted in exactly the same way that they've been for centuries. And they are designed to last for centuries. This is where the mosaic process begins. And this is where it ends, nearly 4,700 kilometers away in Abu Dhabi. We wanted, yes, to give a, a new, modern impact. But of course, there had to be a sort of a uh, respect and attention to the traditional, uh, uh, let's say, kind of decoration and finishings, etc. A modern version of a traditional way to do the, the cladding of the walls. Marble, mosaics, glass are materials they have been always used in the history of all those buildings. 
Dozens of artisans work in sheds on the site, crafting semi-precious stones to be inlaid into marble tiles. Everything is done by hand, and everything is designed to fit perfectly. No computer models, no production line assembly, and quality, not speed, is the keynote. The inlaid marble slabs are polished and ready to be mounted on the 1,096 columns along the arcades that surround the central area. In total, more than 20,000 panels are required. The mosque's 17,400 square meter central area had to be paved with marble as well. And not just plain white marble. The floral concept had to be followed through and the first design concept of total coverage evolved into a more subtle approach. The Mosque of the Flower isn't meant to be overly ostentatious, so the floral design becomes a perimeter feature swirling around the edge of the central area of dazzling white marble. The complex web of steel scaffolding is beginning to come down in the main prayer hall and the interior of the main dome is at last revealed, fully panelled and awaiting the arrival of the world's biggest chandelier. Thomas Faustig is in charge of the chandelier's construction, which is being manufactured and assembled in his Munich factory in southern Germany. However, his designers and engineers aren't working on just a single central chandelier. They are extremely large, 10 meters diameter by 15 meters height. That is equal to a five to six story building. There are two secondary chandeliers with a diameter of eight meters and a similar height. And there are another four smaller ones but small is not small, <laughs> they are four and a half meters, something like that, but in comparison small. Uh, so the, the whole lot is seven chandeliers, seven principal chandeliers for the seven principal domes of the mosque. The main chandelier has a staircase within it to allow technicians to enter and carry out checks on its LED lighting system. This system was chosen because of its long life which keeps maintenance to an absolute minimum. The large chandeliers weigh about 12 tons and they are made of stainless steel and gold-plated brass sheets. And the crystals are also quite unique because they are fixed onto glass panels and uh, this is also a new technology which was not used in such a fixture before. The Austrian company Swarovski has been subcontracted to supply the crystal. Do not ask me how many crystals were used because I don't know, but I can ask my friends at Swarovski. They should know much better because they are going to invoice me with all that. <laughs> Swarovski will be billing Faustig for nearly 40 million pieces of fine crystal. The chandelier is made of the best materials available without any oxidation, it's all stainless steel and gold-plated brass. It should last for the next 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 or even more years because nothing can go wrong. This one will be the new Guinness Book record chandelier, yes. And below the world's largest chandelier will be the world's biggest carpet. It's being woven across the Persian Gulf in Iran and designed by Iranian artist Ali Kaliki. It's about uh, 5,700 meters square. It's been woven in Iran by hand, uh, totally by ladies, uh, women who's uh, doing this. About 1,200 women work in three shifts to finish this uh, carpet. This consists of uh, nine pieces. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. About 2.5 billion knots in the total carpet, maybe more. 
The size it will be about 5,700 square meter and the weight will be 47 ton because there's a 12 ton cotton they're using and the rest is the wool. It's a take about two years. The nine segments will be shipped to the Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque where a further task is being undertaken. The carpet segments must be seamlessly woven together as they are laid in the main prayer hall. This will produce the impression of a single piece that covers the entire area and the Iranians have been flown in to carry out this task. 50 to 60 people going to work for four months. It's something unique. And our carpet is considered to be the biggest one in the world. The Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque has the biggest carpet in the world and the biggest chandelier in the world, but requires a religious focal point. To complete their contribution, the Italians now provide an innovative design for the mosque's most important feature, its prayer wall, featuring the 99 names of Allah. To fully realize his unique concept, Lorenzo Carmelini required a special quality of marble, and for him, that could only be found in one place. Pietra Santa, on the western coast of Italy, has been associated with marble since antiquity. It's a picture postcard town, popular with tourists, and many contemporary sculptors have made it their home. Its famous past resident, the legendary Michelangelo, is still remembered and revered today. What gives the town its fame is its close proximity to one of the world's oldest and purest sources of white marble. Here in the mountains, less than 15 minutes drive away. The vast quarry of white marble is where Michelangelo selected his material. A quarry that provided much of the marble that adorned ancient Rome at the peak of its empire and the same quarry that today is supplying the marble for the Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque. The prayer wall is being assembled from local white Bianco P marble and it's been chosen from this particular locality because its colour is subtly different to that of the main prayer hall material from Lhasa. The intention is to have the distinctive prayer hall wall stand out from its surroundings. The Lhasa marble is cold white, and the Pietra Santa marble has a warmer, milky colour. In another factory, further individual pieces are being cut and crafted, and within weeks, everything will be shipped to Abu Dhabi for reassembly. Creating a monument in marble requires a lot of stone, and the quarries in Macedonia eventually provide an affordable solution. There was a search around the world for white marble to try and source the purest white marble in the volumes that were required for this project. The marble from Macedonia that's to encircle the huge supporting columns in the main prayer hall is cut into thick slabs and shipped to Dongguan in southern China. This industrial city is one of the many worldwide locations contributing expertise to the project and Kaula al-Sulamani and her advisors regularly visit all of them to check on product quality and progress. Their supplier is part of one of the biggest marble and granite working conglomerates in the whole of China. The project director's focus is the marble being delivered here from Macedonia. Hundreds of interlocking segments are being meticulously carved, polished and inlaid. The segments will cover the massive columns supporting the three main domes of the mosque. But time and quality is critical. 96 column, 4 meter high, 2 meter diameter to be done in 3 months. 
and these are not just columns, they are engraved by hand with natural mother of pearl. So the thickness of the marble had to be enough to allow us to carve them without having this problem of cracks. Not all the marble supplied from Macedonia is living up to expectations. Too much of it has minute flaws and is cracking. The project director is there to put the schedule back on track. But can replacement marble be delivered from Macedonia fast enough? The exterior marble cladding for the 82 domes of the mosque has been completed. All that remains is for them to be capped with decorative pinnacles, and those for the main domes are of considerable size. They've been fabricated from advanced composite material, and their surface is covered with golden glass mosaic tiles. Their placement requires personal care and attention. So members of a specialist Malaysian team strapped into safety harnesses ride the pinnacles aloft to secure them in place. Capping the three main domes is the most dizzying and delicate operation of all. Time to complete the Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque is running out. After 12 years, will the mega mosque be ready for its grand opening? The opening of the Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque is now just days away. All 5,700 square meters of the world's biggest carpet in the main prayer hall have been vacuumed clean. The huge doors of the main prayer hall are closed for the air conditioning system to be fired up. Below ground, Cool air is pushed through a long maze of massive ducts from the air conditioning plants. Outside, landscaping is put into place that will eventually encircle the mosque. And as shadows lengthen, the work of cleaning and polishing in the central area goes on long into the night. The deadline has been met with little time to spare. And evening sees the main prayer hall's interior mellow into a warm, ethereal beauty. This is when the world's biggest chandelier comes into its own glittering with Swarovski crystals. It should last easily a thousand years and more. It is a huge project. It's considered the third largest mosque in the world. Non-Muslims aren't usually allowed into mosques in Abu Dhabi. However, the Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque is an exception. It's have a different element from different part of Islamic work and from our local traditions. A place for all Muslim from different world to come to visit. Not just the Muslim, everybody. It's incredible to see the quality achieved and, and the time the deadline was met. It's good to be here and to see people enjoying the visit. 
we have a special scenarios for lightings. We have a special lighting for occasions, we have a special lighting for morning time, and we have a special lighting for nights. The mosque is surrounded by 22 towers, each of them fitted with up to a dozen special effect floodlights. The exterior lighting design recognizes the connection between the lunar cycle and the Islamic calendar. As the moon waxes and wanes, the shade of the white, blue, white light varies. So in other words, the whole surfaces of the building become a mimic of the moon. In order to add some dynamic lighting, we've decided to add uh, some animations to these intelligent luminaires to add cloud shades crossing the building towards Mecca direction, suggesting more spiritual clarity. The late Sheikh Zayed's vision is designed to become the centerpiece of Abu Dhabi's heritage, a megastructure of enduring beauty. Spiritual and national icon is emerging from what was once a featureless desert. An immense project involving thousands of workers toiling in searing temperatures for more than 12 years. This was the grand vision that's becoming a reality. Abu Dhabi Sheikh Zayed Al Nayan Grand Mosque. Building the biggest mosque in the region required an enormous multinational undertaking. The final result is intended to be spectacular, not only in sheer size, but also in its elegant beauty, because this megastructure is an artistic statement on a massive scale. The world's largest chandelier will be the crowning glory of the main prayer hall while the world's largest carpet is being assembled from Iran. This will be one of the largest projects of its kind anywhere in the world, covered from end to end in the purest white marble. The biggest mosque dome in the world is the project's centerpiece. A global quest to find the purest white marble and the very best marble craftsmen in the world extends to Italy, Macedonia and even China. Hundreds of artisans cutting and shaping tens of thousands of intricate pieces to assemble a gigantic jigsaw puzzle of monumental marble. It's a massive and complex international effort. Even British, Belgium, Indians, Bangladesh, Turkish, Filipinos, Arabs. 220,000 cubic meters of concrete, 30,000 tons of reinforcement. The best softwares and the best equipment and machinery. The classical and the modern. Although there's a schedule to be met, the Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque project is not so much a race against time, but an attempt to make time stand still. This megastructure that must survive for centuries, it's got to be built to last. Abu Dhabi is on the coast of the Arabian Peninsula and borders Saudi Arabia. It's the largest of the seven emirates that comprise the United Arab Emirates and the most profitable. Abu Dhabi city is on an island, and its downtown area was already fully occupied, with skyscrapers and new construction. Short of demolishing an entire city block, no space existed for the mosque site. 
The opposite end of the island, however, was far less developed and offered the space needed for a project of this magnitude. In preparation, a nine and a half meter high hill is built up to elevate the mosque to physically and visually dominate its environment. Construction begins in the late 1990s in the center of an area that covers over 22,000 square meters. Poor communication between the Abu Dhabi construction company and its European contractor caused the project to stagnate after initial work. The original company was replaced. British construction group Haltro International comes on board in 2002 as structural supervisor for phase one of the project, the reinforced concrete shell of the mosque. Phase two will involve the final exterior and interior design. Sami al Khazars heads up the Halcro team, initially responsible for the completion of phase one. Great consideration was given to the durability, and this is the reason for this is the, the aggressive environment in which this building is being built. Aggressive environment doesn't just refer to the temperature, it's the air salinity that's the real danger. The problem with salt in the air is that it, it's combines with the moisture in the air and chlorides are produced and chlorides attack the reinforcement within the concrete. So we try and achieve a concrete with a, as low a permeability and porosity as possible. This is the steel that's meant to last for centuries. The reinforcement that provides the strength at the core of the foundation piles. Test bores went down first through sand, then mud, then gypsum, until at a depth of 27 meters, solid mudstone was found to support the piles meant to carry the enormous weight of the mosque. Its sedimentary rock comprised primarily of clay. The location of a solid foundation solved one problem, but at this depth, a second challenge presented itself. All the piles are effectively sitting in the groundwater, and the groundwater is very highly siling because it's so close to the sea. This salt water might eventually seep into the concrete, attack and corrode the steel reinforcement, and critically weaken the entire underpinning of the structure. After intensive testing, a corrosion inhibitor is included in the concrete design to protect the steel. In those piles, we've introduced polypropylene fibers, and this, with the increase in cover to protect the reinforcement, will reduce the amount of surface cracking in the pile. And there are more than 6,000 of these piles holding up the structure, protected and strengthened by tiny plastic fibers to extend their lifetime. It's the air and ground salinity that will dictate the length of the mosque's life and as steel reinforced concrete structures are relatively new, the future is unknown territory. Only time will tell if the engineers have got it right. The phase one construction period takes seven years, concluding with the assembly of the biggest dome of any mosque in the world, nearly 70 meters tall. A massive ring beam of steel reinforced concrete more than 35 meters in diameter supports the dome, which is comprised of 72 precast concrete segments. As each level is lifted and positioned, the recesses between the segments are filled with concrete to stitch them together, and the dome is entirely self-supporting. Once all three levels are in place, the dome is capped with a final pour of concrete, strongly steel reinforced, because this is the point from which the mosque's central chandelier will hang, all 12 tons of it. The main dome and the two secondary domes are constructed to be freestanding and separate from the main prayer hall below. 
because earthquake engineering has been incorporated into their design. A 3 to 10 centimetre gap separates the domes from the main prayer hall to allow the domes on their huge supporting columns to move independently, avoiding stress points that could weaken the structure in a quake. The Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque is as near as possible to being earthquake proof. With phase one completed, the concrete shell of the Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque sits silent and empty, awaiting the exterior and interior decoration that will imbue the mega mosque with a unique identity. Phase two of the Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque project will involve it being clad inside and out with white marble and the installation of the largest chandelier and carpet in the world. The column, the arch and the dome have been described as the trinity of Islamic architecture and although the mosque remains faithful to predominantly Moroccan-based traditional and geometric design, its contours are more free-flowing and reflect a broader fusion of influences. The design includes 407 meter tall minarets, 82 domes of seven different sizes, 96 columns inside the main prayer hall and 1096 columns supporting the arcades. Two rooms joining the prayer hall are for the women, with a capacity for 1,500 worshippers each. Kaula al Sulamani is an engineering graduate from the UAE's Al Ain University, first joining the project as an engineer, becoming deputy project director, then moving up to the top job of project director. As a woman working in construction fields, it is not easy. Everybody putting his eyes on this project as government, as people, as foreigner. Why they change? Who allows to change anything? She meets with her key associates to discuss keeping the project on schedule. The late 2007 deadline for the completion of the mosque structure must be met without cutting corners or compromising the project's integrity. The objective is to give Abu Dhabi a national icon that will last for centuries. So a quick fix to meet the deadline is out of the question. Although speed's a necessity, completion can't be achieved at the expense of quality. And that won't be easy. Hill International's Samir Ohamoud is now under pressure and consults with his engineers about how to achieve the 2007 deadline. Trenches need to be dug and cables laid to fully access the power supply beneath the mosque. Long underground tunnels await electric cables. Much still needs to be done and time is not on the engineer's side. Building a monument in marble doesn't come cheaply. The Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque has an estimated budget of two and a half billion dirham, around 700 million US dollars. Just 50 years ago, Abu Dhabi could not have afforded such extravagance. At that time, Abu Dhabi had a population of 46,000 people, had no infrastructure and apparently no future. A collection of tents, huts and crude buildings, it appeared destined to remain an impoverished desert community on the coast of the Persian Gulf. Neither self-sufficient nor profitably productive, it had relied primarily upon its pearl and fishing industries for its livelihood, but all this was soon to change 
when it became the financial linchpin of the United Arab Emirates. Massive oil deposits eventually made the Emirate of Abu Dhabi the key component of one of the richest nations on earth, the United Arab Emirates. Although the Emirate of Abu Dhabi is only slightly smaller than Scotland, and mostly arid and inhospitable desert, the source of its wealth lays elsewhere, off its coastline, just over the horizon in the Persian Gulf. It pumps 89% of all the United Arab Emirates oil and generates an annual income of 187 billion US dollars. Abu Dhabi city grew rapidly to become a high-rise modern metropolis and the population of the Emirates swelled to over 2 million, not due to a prodigious birth rate, but an influx of foreign workers. More than 60% of the population are expatriates from all around the world. Its success story is largely due to one man. President of the United Arab Emirates for 33 years, Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan Al Nayan was a visionary leader who plotted his nation's path towards prosperity and growth. The UAE now boasts the largest number of construction tower cranes in the world.